This is my 12th video in my AP Biology Review Series, and it is about going from DNA to protein. Griffith's experiment was in 1927. He experimented with the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae. The smooth strain are pathogenic, disease-causing, because they have a capsule that protects them from the animal's immune system, and this bacteria causes pneumonia in animals. The rough strain is harmless because it doesn't have that outer capsule. So this is the experiment. He injected mice with the rough strain, saw that the mouse lived, the smooth strain killed the mouse, the heat killed smooth strain, the mouse lives, but when he mixed the heat killed smooth strain with the rough strain, the mouse died. This experiment revealed that the harmless bacteria could be transformed into the pathogenic strain by a heritable substance from the dead smooth strain cells. We now know that that substance is DNA. Avery, McLeod, and McCarty did their experiment in 1944. They're scientists that tried to figure out what the heritable substance was that Griffith saw in his experiment. They isolated different molecules from the heat-killed pathogenic bacteria and added each molecule to live, harmless bacteria to see which one could turn it into the pathogenic type. They discovered that DNA was the only molecule that was able to do this. However, many people were still skeptical and believed that proteins were actually the molecules that had genetic material. Hershey and Chase's experiment was in 1954, and their experiment was designed to answer the question we mentioned in the last slide. Is, is it DNA or is it protein that carries genetic material? They used viruses that infected bacteria cells, specifically T2 bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. They grew the T2 phages in an environment with radioactive sulfur and phosphorus because protein, not DNA, contains sulfur. Remember the amino acid uh, group cysteine? DNA, not protein, contains phosphorus. So that's why labeling them with radioactive sulfur and phosphorus was important because you can track the DNA and the protein separately. The T2 phages infected the bacterial cells. A blender was used to separate the phage from the cell. Radioactivity of the pellet and liquid were measured. So this is um, what happened with the uh, sulfur, the radioactive sulfur, and they could see that there was no radioactive sulfur in the cells. That means that there's no amino acids, no proteins that were injected into the cell. However, with the phosphorus, they did um, measure phosphorus inside the cell, which means that, that the virus was injecting DNA in it because DNA, again, has phosphorus and proteins do not. So this showed that DNA is definitely that heritable um, material. Rosalind Franklin, was an x-ray crystallographer who created the very important image that showed the helical shape of DNA. This is um, x-ray crystallography. An x-ray is aimed through crystallized molecules. The crystals diffract, which means deflect, the rays into an orderly pattern that can be seen on the film. And this technique allows scientists to determine the three-dimensional conformations of macromolecules such as DNA. This is that um, very important picture that she helped create. Fellow researcher Maurice Wilkins shared the photograph with Watson and Crick without Rosalind Franklin's knowledge or permission. And Watson and Crick and Wilkins later received a Nobel Prize for their work. Watson and Crick proposed the double helix structure of DNA they were greatly helped by Franklin's photograph, but um, unfortunately she passed away 
before the Nobel Prize was awarded. Messelson and Stahl proved that DNA replicates semi-conservatively. That means that the parental DNA molecule separates into two strands and each strand acts as a template for the new strand. So that's why it's called semi-conservative. We have an old strand and a new strand. They used heavy nitrogen and light nitrogen, two isotopes of nitrogen. They have different numbers of neutrons. Light nitrogen has an atomic mass of 14, seven protons, seven neutrons. Heavy nitrogen has an atomic mass of 15. We have seven protons, eight neutrons. So this um, shows what they did. The heavy um, nitrogen will go to the bottom of the test tube. The light one will um, go to the top and the one that has a mix of the both will be in the middle. So that's how they were able to determine um, how much of each uh, type of nitrogen was in the new strands. These are predictions. These were three um, kind of competing models. We already talked about semi-conservative. As you can see, that was the correct one. That That's the pattern of bands they saw because there was um, a mix there were strands that had a mix of heavy nitrogen and light nitrogen. Conservative replication was the idea that the parental helix is conserved after being a template for new strands, so it'll open up, be a template, and then reconnect. But as you can see, that wasn't the case. The, their experiment showed that was not true. And dispersive model was that each strand of the new DNA would have portions of new DNA and old DNA, but not um, one strand of each, and that was also proved to be incorrect. So the DNA is made of a sugar, deoxyribose, a phosphate group, and a nitrogen base, which could be adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine. Pyrimid pyrimidines are single-ringed nitrogen bases. They're cytosine and thymine. It's easy to remember them because Pyrimidines has a Y in it, and so do cytosine and thymine. Purines are the double-ringed molecules, and they're adenine and guanine. A binds with T, and C binds with G. Um, we were able to figure that out thanks to a lot of the work of um, Erwin Chargaff. That's why they're called, those two rules are called Chargaff's rules. The double helix is made of two strands in opposite directions. So that's why they're called anti-parallel, because one's going from 5 prime to 3 prime, and the other one's going from 3 prime to 5 prime. And you'll see what I mean in the picture. So as you can see, the strand on the left side is going from 5 prime to 3 prime. It's called that because the phosphate group is on the 5 prime end. Um, that's the fifth carbon of the sugar deoxyribose. But on the three prime end, you can see it's the third carbon on the sugar. And again, on the right hand side, that strand is three prime to five prime, so they're opposite each other. RNA is ribonucleic acid. It's single stranded. It has a phosphate group. In this case, the sugar is ribose. The nitrogen bases are adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. So instead of thymine, we have uracil. And adenine is complementary to uracil. And like we said in the last slide, cytosine and guanine are still together. There's three types of RNA. mRNA is messenger RNA. It communicates message from DNA to ribosome. tRNA is transfer RNA. It carries amino acids to mRNA at the ribosome, and we'll be talking about both mRNA and tRNA um, more throughout the video. rRNA is ribosomal RNA. It makes up the structure of ribosomes along with proteins. DNA replication, it occurs in the S phase of the cell cycle, remember the S phase of interphase. 
In eukaryotes, replication begins at specific places called the origins of replication. Replication bubbles will form, and there is a replication fork at each end of the bubble. And here's a picture showing what I mean by that. As you can see, um, there's bubbles that will form and expand in opposite um, directions at the replication forks in order to um, separate the two strands. DNA polymerases. There's a lot going on in this picture, but we're going to go through each part. DNA polymerases are enzymes that catalyze the elongation of new DNA at a replication fork. Helicase is an enzyme that untwists the double helix for replication. The leading strand continuously forms toward the replication fork. So now let's look in that top corner that I boxed something. DNA can only elongate in the five prime and three prime direction. That is extremely important. And as I just said, that's why the leading strand continuously forms because it's already in the right direction. However, sorry, DNA polymerase will add the new nucleotides. However, the lagging strand will form away from the fork in segments because it's kind of in the opposite direction. But DNA can only elongate in the five prime and three, three prime direction. So that still has to happen which is why it'll form in small segments. It's called, those segments are called Okazaki fragments because they were discovered by a scientist um, named Okazaki. But as you can see in um, the top portion, that's the lagging strand that's formed in small segments. Again, because of the one, um, the, the directionality of forming of replicating DNA. DNA polymerase cannot initiate replication. It can only add nucleotides to an existing strand. So you'll remember like polymerase is in the name of the enzyme and polymers are when we have several monomers. So DNA polymerase only adds only creates polymers. It, 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 it can't place that first monomer. It only adds to an existing thing, which is why we need RNA primers. You can see one in the picture. An RNA primer is a small initial nucleotide chain, which DNA polymerase, I just abbreviated it as DNA pol, can add to. And yes, there are several types of DNA polymerase, but we're not going to get into um, the details, we'll just call them all DNA polymerases. Primase is an enzyme that can create the RNA strand from scratch. So primase will first make that um, primer. And the leading strand only needs one primer, right? Because it can continually form. However, the lagging strand will need several, one per fragment, because each fragment needs to be primed in order for DNA polymerase to be able to add nucleotides to it. So the synthesis of the lagging strand is going to be more complicated, right? Because we're going in the opposite direction, kind of. But again, we're still elongating in the right direction, but this one's like backwards. So primase creates RNA primers. DNA polymerase adds DNA nucleotides to the primer, forming an Okazaki fragment. After the fragment reaches the next primer, DNA polymerase will fall off. The second fragment will be primed, DNA polymerase will add nucleotides until it gets the first primer and will fall off. Another DNA polymerase will replace the RNA primers with DNA. Ligase is an enzyme that joins the fragments of the lagging strand all together, it's kind of like glue. Topoisimer Sorry, tacoisomerase is an enzyme that will relieve the strain of untwisting at the replication fork. Moving on to transcription, which is DNA to RNA. A transcription unit is a portion of DNA that is transcribed to an RNA molecule. RNA polymerase 
not to be confused with DNA polymerase we talked about in the last one, and is an enzyme that pulls the two strands of DNA apart and puts RNA nucleotides together. The antisense strand is non-coding DNA that acts as the template strand for transcription. So it's a little confusing, but the antisense one actually is the template for um, RNA uh, creation. So as you can see in the picture, the RNA transcript is lined up there at the antisense strand. The main stages are initiation. RNA polymerase binds to DNA at the promoter. A promoter is a specific nucleotide sequence that the RNA polymerase will bind to. There's elongation. RNA polymerase adds nucleotides toward the three prime end. Termination. RNA transcript is released and RNA polymerase detaches. So let's talk a little more in depth about initiation. In prokaryotes, RNA polymerase recognizes and binds directly to the promoter region. However, as you know, many things are more complicated in eukaryotes, and transcription factors help with the binding of RNA polymerase and the start of transcription. Transcription factors must bind to the promoter region before RNA polymerase does. Transcription factors plus RNA polymerase bound to the promoter is called the transcription initiation complex. The Tata box is a common promoter DNA sequence. It's called Tata because it's basically like TA, TA, um, thymine, adenine, thymine, adenine. So as you can see in this picture, starting in the first, first portion, we have the Tata box and then a bunch of transcription factors will bind to it. Um, and the details aren't that important. And then the RNA polymerase will only be able to bind after all those transcription factors are already bound. Elongation and termination. Elongation, RNA polymerase will untwist DNA exposing bases for pairing with RNA nucleotides. The double helix will reform as RNA molecule is created. Termination. In prokaryotes, transcription ends after the termination sequence in the DNA is transcribed. In eukaryotes, the polyadenylation adenyl signal sequence on the DNA is transcribed, and it codes for the po polyadenylation signal AAUAAA, so that's again adenines and a uracil, in the pre-mRNA. 10 to 35 nucleotides downstream from that signal, the proteins on the pre-mRNA will release it from the DNA. Transcription ends when RNA polymerase falls off the DNA. RNA processing, so before mRNA is processed, it's called pre-mRNA, but after it's just mRNA. First, a five prime cap is added, a modified guanine nucleotide is added to the 5' prime end. Then there's the poly A tail, which is 50 to 250 adenine nucleotides. So remember, adenine is uh, one of the nitrogen bases, and that um, nucleotide, there's a ton of them added to the 3' prime end. And they both protect, so both the 5' prime cap and the poly A tail protect mRNA strand and help it attach to the ribosome. Introns are removed. These are non-coding regions of the transcript. Exons are eventually expressed, so E eventually um, expressed. UTRs are untranslated regions. They're at the five prime and three prime ends. They will not be trans Lated into protein, but they're still important for other things such as binding to a ribosome. And um, I just want to make it clear, RNA processing happens in eukaryotes, but usually doesn't um, exist in prokaryotes. In prokaryotes, it'll just go straight from transcription to translation. So here's what that five prime um, cap looks like. As you can see, we have 
our nucleotide there at the top, five prime end, and then we have this modified guanine um, being added to it. As you can see, the primary RNA transcript, pre-mRNA, primary RNA, same thing. We have exons and introns, then the introns are removed, the five prime cap is added, the poly A tail, and we still have those untranslated regions. Alternative splicing is that one gene can code for more than one polypeptide because of introns and exons. Depending on which portions are considered exons, several polypeptides can be formed from the same pre-mRNA, which is pretty cool. Scientists used to think um, there was this thing called the one gene, one polypeptide um, hypothesis, hypothesis, but that's not um, necessarily true because of this. This is a simplified um, diagram, but it still shows, it still gives you a good idea of what I mean. Um, as you can see, the different ways that it's spliced will lead to different proteins. Translation. Again, in prokaryotes, translation occurs right after transcription. There's no RNA processing in the cytoplasm. But in eukaryotes, again, stuff is more complicated in eukaryotes. Um, processed mRNA leaves from the nucleus to the cytoplasm can also occur at a ribosome near the rough ER. mRNA moves through a ribosome. The tRNA, remember transfer RNA, will bring the correct amino acid to the ribosome. There's three main stages, initiation, elongation, termination. Again, there's a, those are the three uh, main stages that transcription is also divided into, but it's also true for translation. As you can see, um, that green thing is the ribosome. tRNA will bring um, the correct amino acid by reading the um, mRNA. We'll talk about that in the next slide. mRNA is read in groups of three nucleotides. Each codon codes for an amino acid. tRNA has the anticodon, which matches with the codon and will bring over the proper amino acids. Initiation, translation begins after the start codon, AUG is read, so adenine, uracil, guanine. Elongation, mRNA is read and tRNA brings the correct amino acid over, forming a chain of amino acids. Then termination occurs when the stop codons are read, so UAA, UAG, UGA. Again, these are all um, nucleotides, uracil, adenine, adenine, and so forth. Polypeptide chain will be released. Wobble is that the base pairing rules are more relaxed for the third nucleotide. For example, um, guanine, cytosine, uracil, and guanine, cytosine, cytosine, both code for the same amino acid, alanine. So this is the genetic code, which shows what amino acid every RNA codon codes for. Almost all living organisms use the same genetic code, which is why um, it's evidence that, they're, um, that they have common ancestry. So as you can see, you can see the wobble, you can see how several um, codons can code for the same amino acid, and that's why there might be um, a mutation in a DNA, but it's a silent mutation, which means it doesn't really have an effect because the codon still codes for the right amino acid, but we'll be talking more about um, mutations in the next video. Thank you so much for watching, and please subscribe if you would like to see more videos.